Hello, hello, hello. Tis I, Rose. I wanted to make a quick little video about something that I bought recently, and that is the Rise of the Guardians art book. Rise of the Guardians is one of my favorite movies of all time. For a while it was my very favorite movie and it's my feel good and I've watched it like 40 or 50 times. I could probably go the rest of my life without watching it and be fine because I have basically the entire thing memorized. And it's also a gorgeous movie and very near and dear to my heart. It's probably the most beautiful 3D animated movie I've seen. Well, okay, maybe Spider-Verse be- mm. Mm. So this is what the book looks like. We have the Guardians on the front and then Pitch Black on the back. And I'm gonna take off the dust jacket because it's annoying and... Oh, shice! And also I kind of like the cover better without the jacket because look, it's like... Now it's it's got kind of this geometric look to the Guardians as well as Pitch Black and it's kind of matching up because this is sort of like... I guess it's like the top of the, of the moon rock when... The, the the guardians find out that Jack is going to be the next guardian. So now you can see all of their faces much better without the dust jacket in the way. Is this making you uncomfortable? It's going to be a lot more of this in this video. <laughs> yeah, I'm a basic bitch and I have a crush on Jack Frost. Is that weird? Because I'm 20 and he's like 17. He's 300, fuck it. There was a foreword by Alec Baldwin who voiced North, aka Santa Claus, and then there was a preface by William Joyce who wrote uh, The Guardians of Childhood, which is the book series that Rise of the Guardians is based on. They go much more into detail about this throughout the book, but at the top here we have kind of the domains of all of the six characters. So we have the North Pole, the Tooth Palace, the Sand Clouds, the Warren, Burgess, and Pitch's Lair. <laughs> oh. I'm just gonna be saying it's so cool and so pretty throughout this entire thing. North Pole! The, uh, the, the Guardian of Wonder! <laughs> I love these little, like, mosaic things that they have. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Admittedly, North probably has my least favorite design. Not because it's a bad design by any means. I love that they make him, like, huge and Russian and like a warrior. It's just all of the other designs are so great. But his kind of pales in comparison. Also, his beard weirds me out just a little bit. And then we have the yetis that work in the shop and the elves. And something I found out about the elves was that the reason they wear these funny little outfits is because the yetis used to wear those outfits as hats. And then the elves came in, like the invasive species that they are, and like took their hats and never gave them back. Adorable. <laughs> and we've got North's workshop where he makes toy prototypes out of ice and then, oh my God. This is just, can I live here, please? Everyone loves the sleigh. Oh, and then they have these like really cool, I don't even know what, like motifs sort of. It's got um, the Matroshka dolls. And then yeah, at the center, there's a tiny wooden baby. And then playing cards with North and a Yeti and an elf on it. And then naughty and nice, like his tattoos. Oh, it's so rad. Bunny Empire. I don't know why they called it the Bunny Empire. Like, doesn't he, he lives in a warren. <laughs> the Guardian of Hope. They talk in here a lot about how uh, Bunny was the character that went through the most changes because originally they envisioned him to have like a lab coat. He was supposed to be kind of a scientist and a perfectionist and like really uptight. And then Hugh Jackman got cast to play him and they were like, well, we can't, we can't, we can't do this. We, he has to be an Australian badass, which is nice because I can't remember any other time when Hugh Jackman was allowed to use his natural accent. And little Sophie with all of the Easter eggs. Oh. And when he's in his miniature form, oh my God. You know that if this movie had done better at the box office, there would have been so many plushies of little mini bunny. I didn't even know what page this was, but oh my god, the Warren. The Warren is my absolute favorite out of all the Guardians, like, locations. Oh, it's so gorgeous and lush. The green everywhere and all of the flowers and the eggs and it's... Oh. <laughs> Tooth Palace. Guardian of Memories. I think they said that Tooth was the most difficult to animate, which I believe because she's like a hummingbird. She has these wings that flutter constantly, super rapidly. And she has these gorgeous iridescent feathers covering her body and she's so pretty. It's interesting to see this little bit at the bottom here because she had like 
varying skin tones for a while and then they just decided to make her a white girl. Although the movie doesn't delve into the fairy's parentage, some of the images hint at a romantic love between an Indian Maharaja and a magical bird. We stand bestiality. <laughs> and then the little mini fairies like Baby Tooth and spoiler-ish, lots of spoilers gonna be taking place here, but a uh, fan theory is that the little baby tooth that hangs out with Jack is actually like kind of a reincarnation of his little sister because they have like the same mole under their eye and they talk about how they had to make Tooth Palace basically completely vertical because Tooth and her fairies have wings and they fly everywhere and it's extremely rare that they would be sitting or standing. I think the only time that we see Tooth like walking is when she's lost a lot of her powers. Of course it stands to reason that there are these like beautiful kind of conical floating structures. Ah. Oh nice. And it's like this salmony gold, so it's such a nice contrast with the, the green of the fairies and ah, design. The Life of a Sequence, which talks about the kind of the, the traveling from the North Pole to the Tooth Palace and the battle and when the Tooth Fairies are being kidnapped by the nightmares. It is one of the most detailed labor-intensive sequences in the film. You have all the hero characters in this scene. A feathered character, a couple of humans, a furry rabbit, and a particle character. Then you have their clothes which are some of the most sophisticated ones that we've created at the studio. Oh, and the wind is blowing and they're flying too. Getting the details right was challenging, but we bent some rules to get the visual richness that was required for this scene. When I first opened this book up, I was afraid because I thought this was supposed to be attached and had fallen off, but... Is that my own version of like Link opening chests? Oh fuck, oh god. Oh, I ripped it. Oh, woe is me. This is kind of a flowchart on how making an animated movie works. And there are arrows pointing in every direction ever. And oh my god, that's intimidating. These are quotes from like everybody who had a hand in making this scene about how hard it was to make this scene. And this is kind of going step by step through the animation process. So we have storyboarding and then I guess concept art, 3D modeling, surfacing, so like tiles and mosaics and stuff, rigging, which I guess is like character expressions and physiques and stuff, layout, which I would assume is how everything fits together, animation, so giving everything motion, I guess, character effects, you know, getting the feathers right and the fur right and the hoodie right, crowds, so the tooth fairies and the nightmares, matte painting, which I don't know exactly what that is, but I guess it's kind of like making everything look real, effects like the light explosion and the particle effect, and then lighting, which oh, gives it so much depth and it's so beautiful in contrast and oh. The cludes turn into a square-shaped clude. Guardian of dreams. Those of you who may have seen this movie know that Sandy doesn't speak. Um, but you might not know that the reason he doesn't speak is because he doesn't want to wake the sleeping children around the world. I love him. He's just, I mean, look at the beautiful little face. Oh, the Sandman and Pitch Battle. This is some of my favorite concept art in the entire, uh, the black and the yellow and the, the lighting in here. Oh my Christ. I wonder if, spoilers, if they killed him off in the movie just so they wouldn't have to animate him for a majority of it. Like, obviously not, but can you imagine how funny that would be? Pitch's lair. Nightmare King. This is so sick. Oh my god. Apparently Pitch's Lair is based on like Venetian architecture because it's supposed to be like the, the depressive sinking city of Venice. Ugh, Pitch is so cool. He's such an awesome villain. He's not a twist villain, which is, you know, a trend in a lot of current animated movies. You know who he is from start to finish and he's sympathetic and he's cool and elegant and bold and seductive. Like you almost want to join him. He's so charismatic. What goes together better than cold and dark? I mean, being voiced by Jude Law certainly helps. His design is so simple and effective and I love it. Oh my God, look at that. Oh my God, the amount of effort. I'm not even an artist and like this pains me. Pitch tempts Jack. This scene is so cool. It's one of my favorites. Actually like that moment, on that's like my favorite part of the movie it's like my sweet spot i just oh and and it's so surreal because you you walk in one place and you end up in another and there's so many shadows and oh. and then the antarctica scene and everything's so vast and white and cold and empty just like how jack feels inside and then pitch is such a stark contrast against all the white and oh 
The human world. Guardian of fun. My baby boy. The heartthrob of Tumblr. He's also a sensitive guy who verges on being a bit of a hunk. A bit. <laughs> Understatement of the century. You're talking about like silicone skin modelings and like the blue tint and the what out. Oh, I don't even know, but it's so cool. And Burgess and Jack discovers Frost. Jack discovers. Okay. The very opening scene of the movie when Jack picks up his staff and, and knocks it against a tree trunk, and then these icy, swirling tendrils are like spreading and crawling over the bark and then and they keep doing it even when he hits another tree and it's you know your attention is diverted to that one but if you watch the first one like they're still growing and it's there's so much detail and then the wind picks him up and I mean that moment I was like I'm watching a gem right now and that scene alone is part of why I think this is one of the most beautiful movies that exist. Jamie my other baby boy god now and the scene when Jamie believes in Jack is one of my favorite scenes in cinema ever I he sees me oh my god <sighs> Bunch of art for Jamie's room and the other kids' rooms. Here are the other kid cupcake. We love cupcake. And then for the entire town of Burgess, oh, so good. I love a snowy town. And this is cool. This is, I guess, posters that they had throughout the movie. I definitely remember this one because this is the one that Tooth runs into or flies into when they're doing the tooth collecting sequence. Hannenberger's hamburgers because Patrick Hannenberger worked on this movie. And this is just, oh, I'm so happy to have this. And I wouldn't make a video because I have other art books and stuff for like Undertale and, and all that. But this movie means so much to me and I wish more people knew about it because it tanked at the box office and I think, I could be wrong, don't quote me on this, but I think they had to fire like 300 people at DreamWorks in order to make up for the loss that this movie made. And by no means is it the best movie ever made, but it didn't deserve to tank and it's so beautiful and stunning and like so much effort and love went into it. And because it tanked, there's of course course like no licensed merchandise you know there's Etsy and all that but this is kind of one of the only things that we have and I just want more people to know about this movie because it's kind of embedded into my soul at this point. It's funny the amount of videos that I've made about Dead Poets Society because even though I love that movie this has been part of my life for so many more years and uh, it's like a part of me now and I hope to make something that touches people in the way that this movie touched me. I mean, hopefully it'll be a little more successful monetarily. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching this video. I love you very much. Bye-bye.